Um, so welcome everyone, welcome our panellists, welcome the attendees of this webinar and what will be a podcast and a YouTube video as well. Um, my name is Tom Beckett, I'm the founder of Better Century, which is a platform which can help everyone navigate how to live more sustainably through their homes, living, money and transport, as well as how they can influence places where they live and work. This is event of a, one event of a number, um, which we're running at Better Century to try and get to the bottom of how we tackle these problems. We believe that through open dialogue, we will arrive at the truth and actually living sustainably is quite a challenge for people. So we want to make sure that everyone can get to the truth and take part in a big revolution across society, which results in us living in a way which is in balance with the world. There's a few housekeeping points for this. Please ask questions throughout the event when they come to mind by using the Zoom webinar chat function. I've, there is not a message in there at the moment. I will put a very brief message in there saying hi. Uh, please, as attendees, do ask your questions. Uh, the event will run for under an hour, with the format being three to five minutes for each of the members of the panel on the subject of the, of the afternoon or the morning, which is, the, can the whole single-use plastics occupies be filled? Uh, we will be recording this event so it can be shared beyond the existing audience and this event is for those who have woken up to the impact of plastic and what it's and the impact it's having across ecosystems across the world so they can learn what to do is a responsibility on the individual or for supermarkets and government how much can we do through a circular economy and what can an individual do to now make a difference? Without further ado, I would like to introduce the panellists. We have Lizzie Pryor, who's a beach watch officer at the Marine Conservation Society. Lizzie helps the MSC National Beach Clean and Litter Surveying Program by conducting beach litter data analysis, community and volunteer engagement, and coordinates MSC's annual litter survey event the Great British Beach Clean. Lizzie will give us an insight into the most harmful and common forms of plastic waste found on our beaches and presumably on our oceans. We have Liz Joe Ruxton, who works, uh, he used to work for marine conservation in the World Wildlife Fund and then went to work at BBC Natural History Unit and saw the devastation that is being felt across, within our oceans. Uh, Joe felt there wasn't enough of a good story being told about plastics while she was there. There's such a focus on the natural environment that Jo felt there needed to be more of a narrative about the impact of plastics. And so she decided to do her own film on this, A Plastic Ocean, raised a significant amount of money to help deliver this. Um, and this, is, this film has now been viewed in 70 different countries. Uh, Jo has founded Plastic Oceans UK, which aims to transform how consumers, governments, and businesses view, use, and dispose of plastic, with an ultimate aim to have plastic classified as globally as a hazardous, uh, globally hazardous in our oceans. Connor Bryant is with us. Connor is a circular economy entrepreneur. He is co-founder and director of Loop Innovations and the Rubbish Project. One of their first products is the Rubbish Cup which is the only cup in the UK that is made from 100% recycled, recycled plastic and is part of a closed loop circular economy solution. No new plastic enters the planet to make the cups and no waste plastic is produced after they've been used. Connor believes the populist anti-plastic movement may in fact be doing more harm than good. Plastic in many cases is the most environmentally friendly material choice, especially in a circular economy model. And there are mountains of scientific evidence to support this. Ocean plastic is a massive issue, but it's a waste management issue, not a material one. Melissa James also joined us. Melissa James grew up in rural Wales, which piqued a love for the environment at an early age. At only 20 years old, she spends most of her time volunteering to run a Facebook group, Journey to Zero Waste, a journey to zero waste in the UK, which currently has nearly 40,000 members and is the biggest in the UK. She is vegan and battles consumerism through minimalism. She is fascinated about what can be done to tackle plastic waste, as so many of the members in the, of her group find it difficult to make these decisions and feel isolated. Without further ado, I'm going to invite the 
panelists to give three to five minutes on their view of the question, can the hole that single use plastic occupies be filled? So without further ado, I would like to invite Lizzie Pryor to kick off. Hi, so, so yeah, for my job as Beach Watch Officer, um, I work primarily on our citizen science project, um, delivering beach cleans and collecting litter data, and we've been doing that uh, for the last two and a half decades. So monitoring our litter levels, seeing the types of stuff that oh, we are finding in our environment, and using that data to, um, for, uh, to encourage behaviour change, um, but also up into policy change as well to stop that getting into our oceans in the first place. So, um, so yeah, so just from a, a data perspective on what we're finding, um, even last year alone um, for our Great British Beach Clean Weekend in September, we saw an average of um, 558 litter items for every 100 metres of beach in the UK, um, with around about 30% of that coming from public litter. Um, and but we also find about 45 to 50 percent of what we find is non-source so that's the stuff that are really small pieces of litter that are no longer can be identified as a particular litter item so there's still a, a huge amount that we're unaware of where that um, where that kind of originated from um, so still a huge problem on our beaches we're still seeing an upward trend of litter um, on our coastline so um, for us I think it's looking at a waste uh, generation problem rather than a waste management problem. So even though waste management is something that we need to look at, um, uh, we need to actually think about what we're producing in the first place and look at right at the start and whether these things even need to be uh, even need to be produced and look at the reduction first as a, a primary focus. Is there any particular pieces of litter which you find commonly which I suppose irritate you the most, Lizzie? <laughs> Uh, all of it really in terms of irritation but um, the number one litter item we find is obviously plastic pieces um, so for, for that it's uh, we're finding hundreds of those for every hundred meters of beach that's number one every single year but it's also things like cigarette stubs is also um, really high number two for last year um, and again those all contain bits of plastic as well um, and with a huge amount of litter um, coming from the general public it's a it's a very quick thing we can think about about how we dispose of our litter but also thinking about the vast about volumes that we generate um, uh, and how we can try and reduce that. Yeah and do you know where all that's coming from is it coming down our rivers or is it just being deposited straight on the beach? Can you tell us a, lot? Um, a bit of both some of it is obviously washed up so it can come from different countries or different areas of the UK and obviously our litter within the UK can travel to other countries um, obviously things directly from the beach we are finding being dropped on there but um, a lot of it um, sort of just showing that a huge amount um, uh, up to, I think about up to 80% can come from our rivers and inland so what we do we can be miles away from the coast or even in our own bathrooms and what we do there can actually have um, an effect on our oceans. Very good thank you very much Lizzie I invite Jo to give her opening piece as well. Thank you very much Tom um, it's a, a pleasure to be able to uh, meet everybody else and have this conversation. Answering the question, can the hole be filled? I think we need to actually address why we need single use items in the first place. And that's the idea of replacing that with something else is likely to bring so many other problems along with it. Um, I'm not anti-plastic and certainly uh, the, I'm sure Connor would, would uh, understand where I'm coming from here. Plastic is an amazing product but it was designed not to break down. Plastic was designed to defy nature, unlike other materials. So the very idea that we're making single use items out of it is wrong. And that's why we're in this mess. But even single use items have a place and nowhere is that more important than in medicine. And uh, two of my granddaughters were born very prematurely. And one of them was born at 20, excuse me, 29 weeks, and she was given single-use plastic apparatus to help her breathe, to feed her. She was in a plastic incubator, and then a year later, her little sister turns up, same thing. So I actually thank plastic every day, because without it, I probably wouldn't have those little girls in my life. Mm. So I really think we need to get a perspective on this. Um, I started working on this 11 years ago when I decided to make a plastic ocean and it was following, well, many years uh, diving around the world. And I'd been taking part in underwater cleanups 
certainly from the time I started diving in the 80s and uh, beach cleanups as well. And I think they're really important for stopping plastic getting into the ocean and for getting the message out there. But I really wanted to start addressing the other end and make people realize what plastic is made of, what its life cycle is, and why we really need to address the way we're using it. So I started to make the film. And then as the research came through for the film, I then learned about the link and the threat to human health because of the chemicals that are transported on plastic, they're attracted to it in the oceans and that leach from it. And of course, when plastic gets into the marine environment, it becomes very brittle. It breaks up into tiny pieces and enters the food chain. And we're top predators on that food chain, as well as all of the animals in the ocean that we, we rely on and that we love. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, I mean, to a certain degree, you don't think that the, the role that single use plastics has in society can really be filled. There's so many applications for it. Um, and I suppose that kind of gives me a nice bridge over to Connor. Uh, Connor, tell, tell, tell us your views on this. Well, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I couldn't agree uh, more with um, Joe on that, on that point is that plastics in our, in our society are, are irreplaceable at the moment. There is no other material that we have on earth that can perform the same variety of functions from being incredibly strong to flexible, to clear, to hygienic. And you know, that a no better example than the, the medical industry. It is, you know, it is democratized access to healthcare. Things that were previously so expensive that they were part of the developing world. When plastic came along, it allowed everyone to have EpiPens, everyone to have IV bags, which has improved health across the planet. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that I think that we need to continue the same approach with plastics. Of course, plastics ending up into the oceans is horrifying and should not be happening. It is a massive issue. Um, but I would feel the same about, I feel the same about all other forms of waste as well. You know, we're so focused on plastic as a single use item that we forget that many of the alternatives that people suggest are they go, oh, let's get rid of single use plastic and switch to single use cardboard, which despite not really solving the waste problem, just shifting it into a different sphere, also ignores that often by changing from plastic to another material, you drastically increase the carbon consequences. Um, so, you know, everyone's so focused on tackling the issue of plastic waste in the oceans, which is a really big issue, but, you know, our biggest issue in the world is, is climate change. We have about 12 years to, to reduce our carbon emissions by half, to have a 50% chance of, you know, not going up in flames. So, you know, we've got a really significant challenge there and we don't want to be tackling the issues of plastic in the ocean by creating a load of higher carbon products that are m exacerbating our climate change issues. Um, so we have to think about both of the issues at the same time. Um, and then it also comes into that, you know, I'm not just interested in plastic as waste. I'm interested in waste across the board. We're wasteful no matter what we do. We waste food, um, which is actually has an incredible carbon um, footprint. And again, that's part of where plastic even has a, has a role to play. You know, one of the, the common um, enemies of, of, of at, at the moment is plastic food packaging. Um, and I can understand, and there are lots of incredibly wasteful examples of plastic food packaging. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, Ferrero Rocher's is a wonderfully designed packaging, it's 60% packaging, that's a terrible concept and whatnot. But packaging on our food plays a really important role. It keeps it fresh, it keeps it safe, and it makes it last for longer. If we waste that food, we have a much higher carbon impact than wasting that plastic. Food takes, well, a very long time to grow and lots of water, energy, land. Um, and so what we need to be thinking about is what are the real issues we're trying to solve? We're trying to solve the issues of plastic in the ocean and we're trying to solve the issues of carbon emissions. We're not, that doesn't mean that we need to demonize the material. That means that we need to find a way of stopping it from ever getting into the oceans. And we need to find systems that are low carbon. Um, and because of plastics, incredibly lightweight properties and the fact they can be produced at very low energy, it is the lowest carbon material in most circumstances. Very good. Connor, that's, um, that's an interesting perspective. Perhaps, um, perhaps we'll have a different perspective from Melissa. Melissa, what, what is your perspective on this question? 
Um, so what was the single use hall? Um, well, I'm a student. I'm studying bioventry science, so I'm used to a lab. And we get through a lot of single use plastic in the lab. I mean, because we need to keep everything sterile. We're quite often working with food and animal feed and we need to try to keep everything sterile. Um, and it does upset me, but at the same time, there is absolutely nothing else we could use instead. Um, like Connor said, there is, there is nothing similar to plastic anymore. Oh, sorry, am I having a connection issues? A little bit, but um, I mean, maybe perhaps a ton of your video, maybe that, that might, might help a little bit. Um, I might try uh, moving if you want to talk about something else for a second. Okay, fine. Um, well, that's um, that's an interesting perspective from Melissa. And I think that, you know, living without plastic is also a massive challenge. Um, and it's it's something which a lot of people are trying to do in response to this this crisis which we're seeing in the oceans and it is potentially a very viable uh, solution to tackling plastic waste as a whole uh, so i mean you know we, we we have a few kind of questions to kind of move on from the various from the audience and some of the questions which have been put on before um before that melissa why don't we have another go and, and, and tell us a little bit about whether you think it's feasible to live without plastic. Do, 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 do you think that we should be getting rid of um, single-use plastic out of our lives? Is it a feasible thing to do from your experience? Um, well, when I try to reduce plastic, the main area I focused on was my kitchen because a lot of the food I was buying came in a plastic bag. Um, so I try to eat you know, as close to the earth as possible. So I eat a lot of whole food. And a lot of that was coming in like, so like vegetables in a bag. Um, so I, I switched to a veg box, um, so that is like food that is grown within Manchester or around Manchester. Mm. I found that was my best option, but then again I was given veg that I had no idea what to do with. <laughs> um, so I'm only 20 and I didn't really know what to do, like I had like a whole cabbage deep by myself. <laughs> um, but but people, I guess people aren't used to eating seasonal and that, well, that was my issue anyway. Um, but then so, some places, um, as a vegan, I can't get rid of plastic. I still eat tofu, which comes in plastic. Um, so I, I guess cutting out junk food reduces a lot of plastic. Um, but what are you going to say? Um, and what's the experience from your community? I mean, there's a lot of people within that community. You've got 40,000 people within that community. Do they struggle? Do they feel isolated? What's the, yeah. what's the general narrative which they, which they kind of come up with around this? Um, I guess, like I said, people usually focus on one area at a time because if you're um, a lot of, uh, I guess a lot of social media and stuff, they're like showing all these new products and people believe they need to throw out what they already have mm -hmm. and replace it with something that I guess looks better. Mm -hmm. um, so if your toothbrush is absolutely fine and it's made of plastic, there's no point throwing it out and replacing it with a bamboo one because it looks better in a picture, for example. Um, and yeah, it takes a while to actually replace everything because a lot um, a lot of things you already have in your house are absolutely fine and they might not look environmentally friendly but actually replacing it would be worse mm. um, and that's, I think that's the pressure social media puts on people in this community anyway because everyone thinks it needs to be perfect when actually <laughs> you're probably fine it just just being aware of it as well is a thing because a lot of people aren't so is there, I mean, I mean, some of your top tips around veg boxes, that's a kind of good solution, getting stuff locally, in season, you know, it reduces mileage, it kind of helps with kind of carbon footprints and impacts in that from that perspective as well. It seems like a great solution um, for a kind of good amount of plastic, which we might, we might use. Um, what are, what are the kind of, what are the bits of plastic do, do people find difficult to get rid of in your community? Other things, is that... Or easy, I suppose. I, I think it's uh, people are used to living a certain way and they're going to need to play in a lot. Well, I guess people need to play in a lot of efforts to change. Like for me, um, I only I live next to an Asda. That's my only shop. I need to then plan in advance where I'm getting everything. Mm. Uh, but I also don't want to add any, <laughs> any mileage because that kind of ruins the impact of that product. Um, so when I'm coming back from uni, I come past a Tesco. So then I, I factor in what can I get from Tesco. Um, 
but I guess like if you're slowly re replacing things, you need to work out where you're going to get it from. You can't get everything from one shop. <laughs> you're going to need to shop around. And then obviously shopping around has its own issues because of the mileage. It's just, I guess it's just really complicated because people don't really know where to start. Yeah, no, very good. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the questions from the audience. So we have one from Katrina McDonald. How can we tackle bad marketing surrounding plastic waste and sustainability campaigns? For example, McDonald's changed to paper straws, which are non-recyclable. So would anyone like to respond to that first? Connor? Um, sorry, well, I thought it, 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 tied, it tied well in with what Melissa was saying, is that there has been this big rush of what I would call greenwashing products from bamboo toothbrushes to everyone trying to give you as many reusable water bottles as, as they can shove in your face. Um, and you know, we switched from consumerism of wasteful products to this idea that somehow we can still have mass consumerism of eco products and it not have any effect. Um, you, know, you don't need to, as, you, as, as Melissa said, you don't need to switch to a bamboo toothbrush if your toothbrush is already working. Um, similarly, you know, everyone going around buying bags. We, you all have hundreds of plastic bags in your home. So ultimately, the already, um, and that come on your food and stuff. So ultimately, going and buying a reusable tote bag or whatnot does not make any sense. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people encouraging consumerism on the guise of it being environmentally friendly, but actually purchasing more products that have more, take more energy to make to replace a product you already have does not make sense. Joe, Joe, you want to respond? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think that uh, what we need to do is to be as informed as possible and question things. Um, obviously, somebody has questioned McDonald's on this and it's made them think again. The more informed we are, the less greenwashing is going to get past us. And in, in there, most of us want what's best for ourselves, our families and the planet. And the way to do that is to learn as much as we can. Um, I, I completely um, believe everything that um, Melissa and Connor are saying um, about valuing what we have and just being realistic about it. And, and I, I congratulate Melissa on the stand that she's taken because shopping around um, and finding the best thing also takes an awful lot of time and not everybody has time to do that. And what I, what I think people need to do is not feel guilty for what they can't do but to actually congratulate themselves on what they can do. And if everybody addresses this in the best way possible, that will still make a difference. Even if you do suddenly have to grab something because you're late home and you've got people waiting and you've got to get food on the table and all you can find is something wrapped in plastic from Tesco's, then don't beat yourself up about it. Just make sure that next time you're, you're more prepared. I think as long as we, we're, we're aware and informed, and do the best we can that's still going to make a massive difference yeah I think, another, I think another thing as well is that yeah mcdonald's changed their straw but there's still the cup and it still has the plastic top mm, um exactly. but in, in my group i've seen that a few people have been successful with mcdonald's that they've actually refilled their own cup there and um, so that's another option as well Interesting. And do we, think, do we think the best thing McDonald's could have done was screw around with their straw? I mean, they are I think a massive... They, well, they only changed it because they had to, didn't they? Yeah, they're a massive billion dollar company. Couldn't they have gone, hey, we're going to reduce our carbon impact by 10, 20%. That would have been a good environmental policy. But they did something that they just thought would be popular. Can I also question why grown-ups need straws? We all know how to drink out of a cup. <laughs> The one, the one mitigating factor there would be people with disabilities, but I think yeah, they, should be, they should be they, that should be something that you should be able to request for, and not something that is given out on demand. No, exactly. Lizzie, what do you think about straws? Because straws were a big thing because of turtles and the amount of <laughs> straws which were found in in turtles and the impact which was having on them. Do you think it's a bit of greenwash, or, or do you think it's a meaningful <laughs> thing to change? Uh, it's an impact that will is of course positive in terms of having less of those products ending up in our oceans and having something that's more likely to, to break down. Mm -hmm. um, but we obviously also need to look into not focusing on just single items. And I know a lot of these things are coming out as words of biodegradable and all these kind of words are coming out, but sometimes not always the facilities to dispose of them correctly. Um, so I think we need to look at more of a society um, approach and where we need to move to. But obviously if, 
there is an alternative that it will reduce the amount of waste and plastic in our oceans then that's great but of course there's always um there's always bigger things as well so if you don't need a straw at all that's the thing switching one to another is not always the most environmentally friendly thing you can do it's great to no longer produce something that it persists in our oceans or in our environment or in our landfill for hundreds and hundreds of years so producing something that's a more biodegradable is a great thing but if you didn't need it in the first place then that's always the better option good okay so the whole reduce reuse recycle philosophy coming through and that and i think that's yeah. very right jenny five's got a question here which kind of follows this quite nicely which is the focus on recycling is great but we also need to put pressure on the manufacturers and producers to come up with alternatives what options are there out there we can push our supply chain to embrace so can I open that up to the panel refilling i think is is uh, one option it's interesting because when we started um a plastic ocean um foundation uk um Back in 2009 we were talking to supermarkets about allowing people to come for example to the deli counter and bring your own um, your own containers and they were saying oh no we can't do that it's health and safety we don't know whether you'll have washed them and then now most of them will let you so I think there's there's been a lot of sort of well, people power, which has made these things happen. You know, there obviously was no specific law against that. And yet that was what they were hiding behind at the time. Um, so I, 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 think, I think people need to understand just how important their voice is. I also want to make a point now, since we've touched on it, in that we say reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycling, when it comes to plastic, is an absolute last resort. It doesn't m always magically get turned into... A new product and and most plastic ends up in mixed recycling which ends up as black plastic and unless you're in a situation like connor is and i know lush who have their own extruder it'll be mixed recycling that ends up as hard black plastic waste that nobody wants so reducing reusing replacing redesigning rethinking all of these other re's come into play way ahead of just recycling very good connor i suppose it's Okay, so my answer would be, would be two parts. Um, one, the circular economy, and that is recycling, but it is also all of the other things on the hierarchy. And people think when I'm espousing the circular economy, I'm only talking about recycling. But of course, I think it's much better for you to hand an item of clothing down to someone without having to remake it first. Um, but in the case of single use products, when you're talking about single use products, then recycling tends to be the best and only option. Um, of course, there are examples where refillable and reusables work, but, but you can't have a refillable, reusable model for every bit of packaging in the world. You know, you're not going to return all of the boxes that Amazon send you or, or take all of the packaging back to the supermarket so they can put grapes back in the same box. You know, that, that just not, that's just not going to happen. Um, so we need to have a solution for these single use items and even for our reusable items when they go to waste. You know, this bottle is reusable and it will last an incredibly long time, but it will not last forever. Nothing does. So we still need to have the infrastructure to turn our waste into more resources to stop it becoming waste. Um, and it's also a solution for tackling the waste we have out there. Currently, globally, we produce 78 billion tonnes of plastic per year. And we only recycle 8% of it by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's figures, and that was in 2013. So hopefully we've improved. But there's probably even more plastic out there. And that means each year we're creating more and more plastic. If we don't start to try and improve our recycling rate, then you are just going to have more and more plastic waste out there in the environment in landfill. Conversely, if you operate a circular economy model and you start creating massive demand for that plastic waste, you're not only halting production of new plastic, you're also creating demand for the plastic that's already out there. So as I said, you know, with my company, I've never paid for any new plastic. I've only gone and bought what someone thought was rubbish and turned it into a product that I never let go to waste again. Mm. And that's, that's the sort of model with the circular economy. Um, for, for tackling for tackling waste um is there a way in which we can put pressure on you know manufacturers and producers to embrace this yes economy 
but by demanding recycled products. You know, that one of the biggest falters we've had is why plastic isn't recycled. You look at that 8% and you think, why? You look at aluminium cans, it's at 70, 80%. Well, the reason is aluminium cans are worth something and plastic waste is not. Well, why is plastic waste not worth anything? Well, one, because it's incredibly lightweight and that's a benefit right up until it goes into waste, remember, because it's low energy to transport. But because there's no demand for it. People up until now haven't demanded 100% recycled plastic products. So of course, there is no incentive for businesses to do what costs more. It costs more to recycle plastic currently than it does to use virgin plastic because we don't have taxes and incentives and etc. cetera. Um, and also because of scale. Um, and that's ridiculous, but our consumers need to demand recycled plastic. You need to say, when you get a printer or your computer or your TV or your car or new clothes, all of these are made of plastic, but no one goes, my car needs to be 100% recycled. Mm. So if you're not demanding recycled, how are, how are people going to, what's the material going to get used for? Yeah, absolutely. Lizzie, is this something which you're doing at MSC, is to get, get your, your members and those participants in your projects to kind of demand for these things? Is this something which you're doing within your project? Uh, not, not as a, a particular project in itself, no, but, um, but yes, like you said, it is important that we, we can try and recycle our plastic, but it's just also realising there's loads of different types of plastic out there. Mm. Um, so PET, which is obviously, I think, what has been used for, the, for Connor's Rubbish Cup, is a fantastic plastic that can be recycled and it's the best type to be used in terms of recycling um, numerous times. Um, so it is the best plastic out there, but it's just acknowledging that not all our plastic is made from PET and not all of it can can be recyclable so uh, for certain examples like like that rubbish cup then then yes that, that you know using 100% recycled PET is great and trying to close that loop is a good thing you're always going to get a little bit of leakages from a circular economy so the first point of call is always do we need this product in the first place can we reduce the amount of stuff that we are producing and then if that product um, is to be used then can we make sure that it's a product that can be recyclable and then go into a circular economy as much as possible um, but it's just noticing that there's a lot of plastic out there that isn't made of PET and can't have a recyclable content in it if it's going to be used for things like food packaging. Very good and Melissa is there are there members of your group which are demanding for change through the suppliers and, and, and manufacturers? Um, yeah we used to have a lot of uh, like change.org or uh, other what's the word um, additions yeah we used to have loads of them coming through but we stopped really promoting it because none of them were actually resulting in anything unless um, they were actual government petitions which actually get discussed once they reach a certain amount of signatures um, other than other than bringing it to light of the companies unless there's kind of I guess a yeah, profit <laughs> included. I don't think they're really interested anymore. But one thing I was going to say before was around recycling. I think, especially with the general public, there's a lot of misunderstanding with what can actually be recycled, especially as it varies, which wherever you live, it varies. Um, people putting contaminated things in their recycling, which ruins the whole lot then. Um, especially when I'm walking around Chester, for example, they've got like little open topped um, boxes around on the floor for collection and m literally every single box I look in there's something in there that shouldn't be um, mm. and something as simple as that can mean that the entire box gets rejected and just goes to incineration or landfill instead um, I've, I think there needs to be a lot more understanding within the public I don't know I don't know how to bring that about but what can actually be recycled at this moment um, yeah <laughs> There is a bit of information which is shared by councils, but undoubtedly a lot of this kind of goes into general recycled waste. Is there something which we can do to influence those waste processes to do something about this? I mean, kind of your kind of best position for that? Yes, well, that, that's what I was going to say is that actually a lot of the focus at the moment seems to be on pushing consumers to save the planet by themselves. And, you know, they have to have 20 different recycling bins and sort all of their waste and that if they make any noise about how the planet's being destroyed, then someone goes, oh, but look, you drive a, drive a petrol car. Um, when in reality, of course, while us as individuals do have a different, uh, do make an effect, um, it is massive companies and massive corporations that have the biggest carbon and waste impacts. 
and they're almost getting us distracted from challenging them on the decisions they make by focusing us on trying to get us to better sort our waste. You shouldn't have to sort your plastic, all of your waste into 19 different bins because most of the things are impossible to recycle. And picking up on what, on what Lizzie said is that yes, a lot of other plastics aren't recycled, aren't recyclable or aren't recyclable within our current systems. Um, and yet we still produce them. And that's not just plastics, it's the same with mixed material things across the board from lots of the paper and card products that people think are recyclable are not. Um, and so we shouldn't, producers should not be producing uh, these products. And so that is the change we should be demanding as opposed to focusing on cleaning up the mess at, at the very end as individuals. There's a question here from, thank you, Connor. There's a question here from Jenny Fife, uh, again, which is around, the fact that fundamentally it's not in the interest of the retail sector for us to buy less. Sometimes places aren't even welcoming a refilling of a bottle for you. How do we find a synergy between environmental improvements and retail surviving? Is there anyone who does this well already? Melissa, maybe you have a, a suggestion which comes through your group which answers this question. Um, well, I guess, uh, well, I, I try to be what's called a minimalist. So everything that comes into my life, I want it to be in my life. I don't buy things for the sake of it. I don't buy things to replace things I already have if I don't need to. And I give I give a lot of stuff away as well, I, uh, especially on, I don't know if you see a Facebook marketplace. So a lot of my stuff goes to new homes. I guess it stops them buying new ones. Um, but yeah, like you said, a lot of, um, oops, sorry, I just clicked something. <laughs> Uh, like when you go into a supermarket, they're like, buy, buy, buy. You need to buy this. Uh, you're walking down the street, but it's all red sale stickers. Um, but yeah, like that question said, uh, the retail sector obviously wants you to buy everything. Mm. Um, I, but it literally just comes down to you. Does it need to be in your life? Because um, if you already have something that fits, there, it probably doesn't. And then you've also got the second-hand market. Um, if you really do need something, you could probably source it second hand, which has a lot lower impact on the environment. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, that's a good answer. Um, Lizzie, what about what about your um, what about MSC? Do they do anything around uh, this question, which has come from Jenny? Um, so this is on refillables, isn't it? Yeah, refillables, and, and and how do we make retail survive? Do we make you know? Is there a way to achieve that balance? Yeah, no, it is difficult, but it is something we need to be uh, definitely looking at and encouraging people to um, encourage a business to go into that model. And I know some supermarkets are trialing it at the moment and obviously it still increases football. If there's demand and people want to be more environmentally friendly, then they are more likely to want to seek out places that have that option for them to do that. Um, so if supermarkets want to, to be able to be that solution, then there, then there'll be hopefully more footfall to their stores and refilling it, which is still money going into their into their pockets. Um, they're still going in to purchase something. They're just not purchasing the container. They're purchasing the product itself. And Joe, is there anything that you're doing as an organisation and particular key asks which you're taking to government around these these issues? Um, our focus is actually on education and uh, the materials that we have. Uh, now are ones that are to fit in with the um, the international curriculum so that they can be adapted by all schools. What, what we noticed was that a lot of the materials that are out there and downloadable are very difficult for teachers to use because it means them uh, running extracurricular clubs and so on and they had to focus on things that they had to get, these keywords, these topics. So what we've done is weave this subject right across the board into maths, um, language, uh, chemistry, physics, biology, design technology, and so on, so that we have something that teachers can pick up and it saves that dreadful Sunday night thing. I'm the mother of two teachers, by the way, um, <laughs> when they've got to concentrate on their weekend creating these lesson plans. So we've got resources for them. It has clips from the film and we're about to bring out a new range of materials um, for Ocean Discovery Days, which uh, are STEM focused. And if, if all of those are taught right from the time the children are at school, then we are going a very long way to addressing this, this issue. So I, I think education is, is important and it's not just education in schools, it's across the board. 
it's the public, it's the policy makers, it's businesses as well. Um, just to go back to the previous question about how do you, how does retail survive? Um, my initial thought was, well, that's for them to sort out. We're trying to deal with, with the environment. But the other side of it is what I've seen, particularly where I live, which is in Cornwall, people are very concerned about the marine environment. It affects everything we do here. And there are some amazing shops that are starting here. It's all about local produce. It's all about local crafts. It's cutting down packaging that's needed to actually bring these materials into the shops. There's a lot of refills. There's people making their own soaps, shampoos, deodorants, toothpaste, everything, making it all naturally so that we don't need all the extra packaging and all the transport. And I would like to see our failing high streets starting to be replaced by independent stores like this that people want to visit. They can't source online. It brings back the heart of the high street and it's much better products for us to buy that cause least, uh, less, if any, damage to the environment whilst keeping people's livelihoods going. Yeah, I think that's an amazing point um, in terms of how we achieve it. But, Connor, what about you? Is there, is there anything which you would respond to? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think that we need to get more locally focused, more entrepreneurial about these issues, get a drive from the bottom up or from, for governments come from the top down? Well, so um, several things. I'd like to agree with uh, Joe on the on the odd thing that education is, of course, key with pretty much all issues across the board. I think that education is the number one thing that we want to start with. Um, so couldn't agree more there. And then in terms of refill and reuse shops, I think that they are a wonderful thing. And for the sections of society that will use and participate in those, I think that is a brilliant thing to do. Um, but of course, it's not a thing that tackles the issue across the board. And of course, that's only focusing on food, whereas in my industry, I actually thinking about the sort of, you know, other products and, you know, we don't just consume um, consumable foods, but we consume uh, consumer electronics and all the things. And they actually often have a much higher environmental impact, um, but seem to get sort of focused on less. And what I would suggest is that currently we have a model where businesses only profit from selling you a product and then being able to sell you another product further down the line. So, of course, their incentive is to create a product that has a lifespan. This is called design obsolescence. It was unfortunately invented by a product designer like myself, but 80 years ago and with very different agenda to me. Um, and uh, the idea is that, yeah, you buy a product, it will break, and then you'll need to buy a new one. Think printers. If you've ever got a printer in your, in your home, um, a home HP sort of inkjet printer, they are literally designed to break. They are designed to have about a three-year lifespan. And they have parts in them that are meant to break. Um, and of course, that's how they keep their business operating. Okay, so how do businesses survive if that's their one way of saying, well, we've got to change it to a model where they supply the service. So imagine that a printing company, instead of trying to repetitively sell you printers, sold you the service of access to printing. They say, look, you will be able to print a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand copies a year. And we will provide the machine. If the machine breaks, we will repair it, etc. We will keep topping it up. They still get the same continued comeback, except their incentive is to make a printer that never breaks because, of course, they don't want to have to come back and repair it. So they make a product that never goes to waste and that they're in charge of maintaining it and therefore ensuring it doesn't go to waste. And that's how they make their money. Um, similarly, it's the same as what I do with the cups, is that I'm providing a disposable product that could go to waste but instead I provide it as part of a service where I don't leave the customer responsible for the waste management I'm taking responsibility for it myself and therefore my incentive as a business is to make that system as efficient as possible yeah that's a, I think that that's a very interesting model the, the kind of lease service rather than the, the, the purchase service we yeah living in with this kind of sense of ownership actually we have this kind of sense of I suppose a shared product and ownership of those types of things <laughs> now we're going to getting close towards the end of this uh, discussion now and I, I wanted to try and pose the big question to you which is really that plastic waste keeps on increasing uh, you know we you know in 1950 there was two million tons of plastic waste and it's grown 200 times since then. By 2025, plastic waste is 
to increase tenfold. If this carries on by 2050, the weight of plastics in the ocean will be the equivalent to the mass of all fish in the sea. There's, there's, there's something which we need to do to stifle this problem. And we've come to some of those solutions, which is education, consumer demand for change. What do we do to make this happen quickly? And what do we do to make sure this problem doesn't keep on growing exponentially? Uh, and, and, we, and I suppose, do we, can we rely on governments to come up with that, with that solution as well? You know, that, that, that's a question which I'll, I'll suppose I'll, I'll give to panelists in reverse order. So Melissa to go first and then to Connor and then Joe and then Lizzie. So Melissa, what do you think we should all be doing to tackle this ever growing problem? Um, well, a bit like Jenny just said in the chat there, um, a lot of plastic is convenient and cheap and people are going to need to appreciate that replacing it is going to be an inconvenience and it is probably going to cost a bit more money. Um, like the refillable shops, uh, especially local shops, so they need to pay for themselves really and pay for their products. They're going to be dearer than a supermarket. And people, I think, struggle to cope with the fact that it's going to cost a bit more. Um, so I think it, like, like Jenny said, it is kind of realising that replacing your waste is going to be an inconvenience to your life um but again the grand scheme of things it's going to be a bigger inconvenience if the planet's ruined for us um but yeah very good Colin. um well I, I want to you know i'm look interested in pushing for a system where we don't have to opt in you know reusables um going to a refill store all requires people to buy into this concept whereas if we change the way that the people who supply the service to, to us operate, then in a sense, you have no other option to be big green. If you went to McDonald's and the only thing McDonald's served was 100% vegan, 100% carbon neutral food, then that's what you'd have to eat. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in, in pushing from that side of things. Um, and that's where I think that we really want to be focusing on encouraging the circular economy as a concept to be adopted because it, it tackles the issues of waste and carbon pollution in the UK, but also globally. Um, but if your specific issue is plastic in the oceans, if that's the thing that really gets you going and that's what you really want to solve, then it's, you know, it, it, in my mind, it's, it's relatively simple. The first step is turning off the tap. So although we want to get the plastic out of the ocean, I totally agree, but if you have a bath filling up with water, you turn the tap off first and then you bail out the water. Um, and at the moment, a massive amount of plastic is ended going into the oceans and from the land-based plastic that is going into the oceans is majority coming from countries with less good waste management infrastructure um africa asia in fact a lot of it come well the vast majority of land-based ocean plastic comes from rivers from africa and southeast asia um and that region so if you if you really want to tackle this issue in in, in that sense support waste management infrastructure in those countries you know 1.3 billion people around the world do not have access to bins okay so instead of focusing on cutting straws out of your life focus on supporting <laughs> putting a proper waste infrastructure to the people who literally have no other option but to throw their waste in, into the sea joe the uh, Asia and Africa gets a lot of stick actually and, and, and a lot of finger pointing saying oh, it's coming from your rivers. I think we need to remember that a lot of our waste has been diverted there and we're also sending our products there and the, the suppliers are following our demand so all of us need to take responsibility and I completely agree with everything Connor and, and uh, Melissa have said um, but I also think that we need to understand that it's up to us whether we have this defeatist attitude or not you know this plastic waste the, the plastic being produced is exponential it's only because we're still demanding it that, that the producers are actually following that demand and and responding to it we can stop this happening uh, we've just got to understand that plastic is not disposable plastic was designed not to be so we have to stop acting as if it is and uh the, the, the idea of by 2050 there'll be more plastic than fish in the ocean. Nobody knows how many fish there are in the ocean. If we're going to put statistics out, we need to put accurate, scientifically based ones out there. 
There could be, there could be more, there could be less, but let's concentrate on what we do know and try and learn more. And that way we'll tackle this from a very informed perspective. Thank you, Joe. And to Lizzie. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, agree with most of the panellists, really, and agree that we are, um, yeah, trying not to uh, finger point as much as possible. And uh, we obviously send, I know, roughly around 600,000 tonnes of our own uh, our own waste to other countries. Obviously, China's closed its doors now, and other countries are receiving it. And a lot of the stuff um, cannot, is such low grade that it cannot be recycled and obviously a lot of the products that other countries are using are produced in European countries and they are produced with no ability for it to be recycled so definitely have to look at ourselves and in terms of policy um, that's a, a must it has to come from the top has to come from governments and it's organizations people um, that we will keep pushing for um, solutions that need to be implemented at a policy level for anything going to have a seismic change to to that and then to answer the question about filling the hole I think we need to think about whether that hole needs to be filled in the first place you know if we don't need it if we don't need packaging um, then then to not have it at all um, food waste is not going down because of increased packaging we've seen that um, and sometimes can actually cause a problem so I think we need to think about reducing amount as possible and then yep circle economy but understanding that there's always going to be waste with that it's never a completely closed loop so that is the best alternative to look at but really need to have the reduction and it needs to come from policy. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for participating in this discussion. I think we've come to some interesting conclusions around how we can act from top down through legislation and, and I suppose through the kind of creation of systems which will allow for a solution to this problem, but how we as consumers can make a massive difference to this problem by demanding different solutions to plastic and understanding what types of plastics can be recycled and which can't. Uh, if you would like to continue this discussion, um, we at Better Century we are having a discussion on plastics. There are there's lots of information on Better Century about the types of things which you can do to reduce your plastic waste. There are solutions from how you can get toys for a hire for your children through to how you can get plastic free party suppliers you know there are lots of solutions out there uh, and our community is there to help everyone in making sustainable choices and in making an impact to this problem but also to learn how we can also influence others and those institutions which are providing uh, support and, and and manufacturing of plastics in this process. So I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone um, and give them a chance to say a final goodbye. Um, and that's a goodbye from, from me, Tom Beckett at Better Century. Um, hand out over to each of the panels, Connor, Joe, Lizzie and Melissa. Connor, do you want to say goodbye? Yeah, well, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and uh... Well, I was glad that we, we, we all had so much common ground. So I think the key is working together. And I think that, you know, as this conversation has shown that, you know, the more people that we put together and start sort of pushing these ideas forward, the more that we can, we can all learn and advance the conversation. And Joe? Uh, yes, I want to say thank you so much, Tom. It's been lovely meeting everybody. Thanks to those that have listened and sent questions in. If you want more information, particularly if you're a teacher, please go to plasticoceans.uk and you'll find the information that you need. And it's constantly being updated. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. And Lizzie? Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah, it was lovely to hear everyone and the amazing work that everyone's doing. Um, so, yeah, it was really nice to have this discussion and for everyone to take part in the questions. Uh, for the Marine Conservation Society, if you are interested in the charity and what we do... Oh, I think it's just Lizzie that's frozen. No, I think it was just Lizzie and Melissa was <laughs> saying I was, I was waiting to see whether it was all of you, but I think... I think she was about to say, if you want to learn more about what you can do, come and have a look at the Brink Conservation Society website, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure we can fill in for her. So, so Melissa, any final words? I um, just want to say thanks for having me. This was my first webinar thing with people I didn't quite know, so it was a bit scary, but... Um, if anyone, if anyone would like any, you know, one-to-one -one support, I think my Facebook group is good for that because uh, people can really just discuss any issue really to do with waste and give each other advice and just try and learn together and make it, make it a bit of a better place to live. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, 
Thank you to everyone um, and look forward to staying in touch and do come and join Better Century uh, and look forward to our next conversation uh, about topical issues. Um, and here's Lizzie to say goodbye. Lizzie, sorry got frozen out and goodbye from you. Quick. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> cool, yeah, no thanks. Check out the charity website if you want to hear about what we're, all the work we're doing, especially about beach clean stuff. All right, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Cheers, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Cheers, bye. bye.